Hello and welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today's episode is an exciting one. We have an interview with the legendary Marta Kaufman, co-creator of Friends and Netflix's Grace and Frankie. See, um, lobsters, uh, in the tank, when, when they're old, uh, they get with the, they walk around holding the claws. <laughs> In the tank, you know, when, <laughs> with the holding and uh, Phoebes, you want to help me out with the, the whole lobster thing? Do the claws again. <laughs> Marta and I discussed her unusual path to becoming a TV creator and showrunner, how the television landscape has changed over the years, and of course, we talked about the upcoming Friends reunion special. This was a fun one. Check it out. Well, I'm here with Marta Kaufman. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me today, Marta. My pleasure. Thank you. So how has the last year or so been for you creatively? I know it's been a challenge for, for everybody in different ways. What, are, what have you been doing? You know, it, it was very challenging in the beginning when we were continuing the writer's room for Grace and Frankie, especially at the very beginning when you're trying to imagine into the future of a character, but you don't know what the future is going to look like. And Zoom rooms are tough. They're really tough. They're, they're, they suck the energy right out of you. It's very difficult to read the room, to feel the ups and downs of the room. It's just, it's, it's very hard. On the other hand, we've been developing a lot, which has actually been going pretty well. And I think part of that has to do with I, I wasn't adjusting from one world, you know, the way we shot and wrote Grace and Frankie to a whole new world, the way we'll have to do it now. Um, mm-hmm. I was just able to just write. Um, and this is the last season of Grace and Frankie, right? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's been a, having had all the pr- prior seasons done one way and now this last season, you're kind of having to approach a different way. That must be challenging in some ways. You know, we, we shut down in the middle of our fifth episode. So we'll be making that change inside an episode. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very different. It's the COVID expenses are extremely high. You know, we don't know yet really how it's going to look. We've heard stories about how other productions do it, um, you know, but we have four older cast members whom we have to protect. Yeah, I can imagine that being difficult. Can you, I, you know, one of the other things, obviously, that um, I was teased before all of this was the Friends reunion for HBO Max. And, it, you know, it got me thinking, you also uh, co-created HBO's first scripted show, if I remember correctly, Dream second. On. Second. Second, 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 um, which is a show I used to, uh, I loved. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, it's been 30 years between, you know, that and now this Friends reunion. How, how, is, how has it changed for you? You know, you're, you're at the forefront of both of these, you know, HBO things, but um, very different times. What's changed, how has it changed for you in those, over those 30 years? You know, everything has changed over these 30 years. It's kind of cool to be going home, you know, back to HBO. There's something really nice about that. But HBO is very different 30 plus years ago. The thing they used to say to us all the time when we were doing Dream On was, there's gotta be an element to each episode that would not be on network TV. You know, there are so many outlets you know, I don't think that that's something they're they're shooting for as much mm-hmm. as they strive for excellence. Yeah, you know, I would I would I was thinking about Dream On recently because you know everybody was obsessed with WandaVision and its recreation of classic uh, television, and uh, you know Dream On was obviously a bit ahead of the curve there. So it was just funny that to, you know to see everybody talking about that, to see that kind of thing resonating with an entirely new new audience. This you know that many years later, when you were uh, you know I don't want to devote the whole interview to, to Dream On, but when you were first coming up with the show, how did the idea to, you know, include all of those uh, classic television and things like that, uh, how was that, how did that come up with, uh, with the um, show? So what happened was Universal had this library of all these old TV shows, and they were looking for writers who would do something with those TV shows, finding a way to do some sort of half hour comedy and, and use those scripts. And people came up with all sorts of ways to do it. Like, oh, what was that show called where the 
two people discussed what was on the screen. Mystery Science Theater? Yeah. You know, and a lot of people came up with a lot of different kinds of ideas, but David and I came up with the idea that this is a man who grew up on television and that his thoughts were, you know, things from that old TV stuff. Mm -hmm. Rather than using the entire clip or the whole episode, it's just, you know, the entire episode or the entire scene, we just do these really short clips to punctuate where he is emotionally or what's going through his head. Mm -hmm. what, what was funny was after we were doing this, I want to say for about a year or two, we discovered that episodes of, of those TV shows that were made between certain years were turning out to be very expensive if the actor were still alive. Oh, interesting. So we then started looking up clips and going, oh my God, oh my God, I hope that person, <laughs> I hope they're dead. It was very, very dark. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, so getting back to the, the, the Friends reunion, you know, th that show has been off the air for, for so long now and yet, it's still like, you know, when a new streaming service launches, there's like hundreds of millions of dollars to, to secure friends and people are this anxious for a cast reunion this many years later. Why is, what do you know, what are the reasons you think that show still resonates with people, uh, you know, now? I think it's a few things. I, I think these are characters who are incredibly lovable and you love to hang out with them and have a beer with them and invite them into your home. And it's, the show is kind of warm and cozy. Um, and I don't know that that goes out of style. I also think the stories remain to be universal because they're about such a, a specific time in your life, but also about um, what it is to look for love and career and a sense of self. So I think that's part of it. Part of it, I think, also has to do with Netflix having put it on the air. I mean, when my youngest daughter was 16, and this was like six years ago, her friend came up to her in school one day and said, did you see that new show called Friends? They thought it was a <laughs> So that um, gave it a whole new life. I remember reading a, a few years ago, an article in the New York Times, and it was, an inter it was interviews with, uh, with athletes who were from other countries. And they were talking about how a big way that they learn English is from watching TV shows like Friends. And so it must be amazing knowing that the you know, show you created has that kind of universal appeal around the world to the point where it can help people learn a language. That, that to me, I, I think that's one of the greatest things that came out of it. I just love that. I actually <laughs> met somebody recently who told me that. Yeah. That's how he learned English. It, it's pretty astonishing. And it's certainly not the side effect that we were going for. <laughs> um, but the fact that it has happened is pretty exciting. When, you know, when, when, so when you, when Friends, you know, first came out, you're working with cast, you, you know, they'd done other stuff, but they're primary, you know, you know, this was going to be their first big project that they become known for. Now you're working on Grace and Frankie and you've got four legends in, you know, you know, leading the cast. Is there a difference in your approach when you're, when, when you're writing for, you know, the for actors of different, you know, uh, fame levels and, you know, uh, achievement? No, 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 there really isn't. I mean, what, what, the hard part is always getting to know your actor and what will work on them. So you write something and then a cast member comes and breathes life into it. And then you, you do have to start adjusting a little bit based on strengths. You know, like we didn't originally intend for Joey to be stupid but Matt Blanc <laughs> played stupid so well that it became part of it. It became mm -hmm. part of the character. Um, and, and I think that's true if you're just starting out, we, we, you know, and if an actor is just starting out or if they've been around forever. You know, the thing about someone who's been around forever is they know their process really well. They know what works for them. And, you know, Jane and Lily have very different processes. Lily loves props and, and, and sort of helps her work the way she likes to work. And Jane works very internally. And you just have to know those things. You just have to know those things going in and mm -hmm. give them tools that will help them say your words. 
uh, taking the the Zoom room out of the you know out of the equation, is there you know has your experience you know running a writers room in the '90s versus running one and run now? How different is it? It's it's different in a number of ways. I'm different um, than I was in the '90s. So I mean that's that's part of it. I've learned a lot over the years. The room I think is is now much more sensitive than it was. People are more careful than they were. Having learned a lot as a woman in this business, and it certainly started on friends, but I didn't take it as far as I do now. Writers' rooms will sometimes, if there's a majority of men, they will talk over the women or a woman will say something and it won't be heard. And then a man says the same thing and it will be. I don't let any of that shit happen in my room. <laughs> None of that shit can happen in my room. So, you know, I, I talk to a lot of showrunners and I'm always curious to hear what you're looking for when you're staffing a room, because it seems like, you know, from drama and comedy, there's different, you know, things you're looking for, but also, uh, you know, I, I've heard people say like, you know, all, oh, I. I need someone who's really good with ideas. And if they're really good with ideas, that's great. And then I'll have another person who's really good with, uh, with, with plot or with you know, dialogue and that, you know, that's their stuff. So when you're staffing a room, what are you looking for? People with different skill sets? Are you looking for more people with more of a complete package? How, you know, what's your approach? We always start with the script. And if the script itself doesn't speak to us, then the person's not gonna get to go to the next step. So the first thing is, can this person write a good script? And then after that, yes, you do want to find strengths. Who's good at story? Who's going to bring the jokes? Who has the heart? And there are elements of those things that are in everybody's script and it will speak to their strengths. But you can't only go for someone who's going to do jokes. Um, You know, because you shift the room around, you have two rooms going, you need everybody to have multiple strengths. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other thing is chemistry. Chemistry is a huge part of it. You want a room that's gonna click. You know, we're we're together for long periods of time and you don't want someone in there who's gonna be clipping their toenails (laughs) in the middle of breaking a story, you know? (laughs) Taking kind of a, a big step back, what was it that first, you know, inspired you that you knew you wanted to be a storyteller? Is it something you knew from when you were a kid or just did it come later on for you? Oh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, from when I was little, I used to put on plays. This is true. I used to put on plays with my Barbie dolls for God, because my parents weren't all that interested. And I figured maybe God, (laughs) and you know. Good audience. It is, yes. (laughs) I'm I'm not defining God at this point. I'm just telling you that's what I did. Um, But I had a teacher in 12th grade. I had written a paper on, I can't even remember what it was on now. But her comment to me was, her comment on the paper was, it was AP English, was that I was the least perceptive student she'd ever had and I would never be a writer. Ouch. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that stinks. That stinks. So it wasn't until when we were in college and started realizing um, at our school there wasn't a lot of theater for undergraduates that we decided to try to write something for undergraduates. And at the time, I was an actor, and as soon as I started writing stories, I was like, oh man, this is so much better. <laughs> this is so much better on this side of the table. Um, you know, from then on, it was just, we were doing musicals. And then the woman who to this day is my agent came to see our musical, which was off Broadway and said, why aren't you doing television? And we were like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> and then a year later, we were out here. Wow. Uh, what were, you know, at the time, were there Im- big influences on you with the, you know, in your early writing? Two things. Dick Van Dyke. Can't go wrong there. Dick Van Dyke is to this day still one of my favorite shows of all times. And James L. Brooks. Terms of Endearment is the movie I wish I'd written. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think you're alone there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, So they were both big influences. 
And, and I guess, I mean, we, we had the opportunity to work with Norman Lear, which is an amazing experience. I'm not sure he felt the same about us. <laughs> I mean, look, we, we were very young. He didn't want us to run our own show, which was understandable. And he later said that he regretted that, which was lovely to hear. But that was an incredible influence working for, for him. And, and truthfully, I got to say my agent, who is my champion. Yes, it's very rare, from what I understand, to have an agent, the same agent for as long as you've had. Can you talk about that relationship a little bit, you know? So, so people understand, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of aspiring writers think like, you know, once I get a manager, once I get an agent, I'm all set. But the relationship is often much more complicated than that. Can you talk about for you, you know, what you look for in your agent and why that relationship has lasted for as long as it has? Yes. So we met in 1985. Uh, and to this day, Nancy Josephson is still my agent. And what I looked for when we were first, um, when we first came out here to start looking for work, Nancy, you know, that we were meeting with Nancy and a few other agents and the other agents were saying, you have to get a job on somebody else's show before you create your own show. And David and I were like, you know, we don't want to do that. <laughs> we don't want to do it that way. And Nancy said, okay, let's do it the other way. She was just real willing, rather than forcing you into a, you know, a square peg into a round hole, she was saying, okay, what do you guys want? Let me try to help you make that happen. Exactly. We are, it's funny, we are around the same age, our children are around the same age. We've also, we've traveled together. We've become friends as well. We get nothing but support from Nancy and ideas and she sends us books that we may want to consider developing and you know actors who are looking for shows and it's it's such a um, satisfying relationship and and she has my loyalty she has my loyalty and and we've gotten nothing but great advice and look you know you got to have a lawyer you got to have a lawyer. I, I never, for me, had a manager, never felt the need to, um, because my agent did everything I needed her to do. That's, that's fantastic. It's very rare to hear that. I always love hearing when creative partnerships and partnerships like that, you know, span a, a long, a long time. Um, what's your, your writing process like, uh, you know, do you set deadlines for yourself? Do you wake up really early? Do you outline extensively? How, how do you work? I outline it within an inch of its life. Okay. <laughs> My outlines tend to read like short stories because they're very detailed, but my process is I like to ride the waves. You know, I'll say, all right, you know, here's a day I've got to write today. I don't set hours. I get up, have my cup of coffee. And when I sit down to write, I usually, I'll, I'll have a, an idea, I'll be ready to go, I'll write the scene, and then I have to take a break. And I walk away, I let the next scene run around in my head, do something completely different. And then when the next scene feels like it's landed, I go back to the computer and write that scene. Um, and it may actually go into another scene. I never know. It's just what's what's the wave. And I know as soon as the wave has crashed, it's time for me to stand up and walk away um, it, just for a little while. And then I go until I'm exhausted. And you know, that just depends on the day. But I have to say, there is nothing I hate more than the blank page. <laughs> I live in fear of the blank page. So I always do after my outline, a vomit draft. One that no one reads but me. I just get words on paper. I don't skip things. I just get words on paper. And then the big work is in the rewrite. Mm -hmm. And I rewrite a lot. What's a lot? How many drafts are we talking? I probably do five drafts before anybody sees it. 
when you're ready to show it to someone or do you have you know a, a few trusted advise friends and people you show it to or is it like you know a thing where you show everybody on the staff say here's where we're at what's what's your approach in that respect well you know with our development stuff I have a company called OK Good Night, and the first people that will read anything that we write is OK Good Night, and we'll get their notes. And then with things like um, Grace and Frankie, because Howard, Morris, and I write together, we see each other, you know, we write half and half, and we see each other's scripts mm -hmm. before anybody else sees it, and we do a pass together before it goes to the room. And when you say together, does that mean you guys are both like, you know, at the same time working on it? Are you dividing up? Okay, you take this scene, I'll take that scene. How does it work for you? We divide it up by story. One of us does the Grace and Frankie story. One of us does the Robert and Saul. Um, depending on which story is bigger, that person, you know, the person who has less to do will do the kids stuff. And we write separately. But then once we put it together, we get together and go through it all. And has, you know, this general approach been the same throughout your career? Is it something that, you know, evolved over time? It changed over time. David and I used to write every word together, every word. And he was always at the computer. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like I wrote out loud and had to, once David and I decided not to write together any longer, I had to learn how to sit at a computer and write in my head. <laughs> yeah, I can see that, that that being a bit different. Are yeah. you someone that do you do you say the, the dialogue out loud? Do you act the parts out, or is that all in your head? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about a scene one day, and <clears throat> my daughter, when she was I don't know, my youngest daughter, she was a teenager at the time, saw me going like this. I was just I shrugged. <laughs> I said, I don't know in my head. I acted the whole thing, but didn't say anything out loud. And she looked at me like, what are you doing? And I realized I was writing. I was writing. I do all the facial expressions, That's but funny. not out loud. <laughs> okay. but, but I have to say, um, and it's the reason I think table reads are so important. You have to hear it out loud. Mm -hmm. before it gets shot because scripts were meant to be heard and not read. So with things that we develop, I'll pull together a group of people to do a reading just so we can hear it before it goes out. That makes sense. For you, where, you know, where, where does an idea come from? Is it, a, you know, is it a, a, a plot thing? Is it a, a character thing? You know, what, what helps you key into something to the point where you're like, okay, I'm ready to write this? Well, it depends. If it's something, if we're talking something like Grace and Frankie, it's that the, the story is broken. You know, the story is, is clear. And then I go based off the outline. In terms of where ideas come from for um, um, development, it depends. Sometimes like with Jane and Lily, with Grace and Frankie, it was, we had Jane and Lily. What are you gonna do with Jane and Lily? <laughs> so, you know, that was an, certainly an interesting and different way to do it than I'd done before. Sometimes we use IP, um, we'll go off books or a documentary we saw or, and sometimes, and, and these are rarer, you're just in the shower, or in the car, not that I've done much of in the car this year, uh, but I have showered. <laughs> um, we would just sort of go, oh, wait a minute. That's really interesting. And you see if it can become something. It comes from so many places. And do, do those things, you know, are you the type of person where those things percolate for a while and then all of a sudden it's like that? Yeah. Or is it, it is, okay. It, uh, it definitely has to percolate. Well, again, I mean, that's more about fresh development. Yeah. You know, Grace and Frankie, we came up with a couple of ideas for them and sort of honed them both and then decided, no, no, no this is the one we want to do. So that was, that was a very different way to develop things. Really fun. Um, you know, we had such, we have such incredible actors that it felt like we could do anything. Is it, you know, a couple of last questions before we wrap up, you know, just talking a little bit about Grace and Frankie, you know, the cast is remarkable and you have actors like Sam Watterson and Martin Sheen and even Jane Fonda who, and Lily who, you know, 
have done comedy over their career, but you know, specifically when I'm thinking of like Sam and Martin, they're not necessarily known as comedic actors. So has that been a really fun experience for you to get to, you know, take Jack McCoy, who everybody is so used to seeing be this gruff lawyer on Law and Order for 20 years and have, you know, have him be this to totally opposite character? Yes. <laughs> the first table, the table read we did for the pie, well, not called for the first episode, within three minutes, my shoulders came down. <laughs> <laughs> because they were so damn funny. So funny. You know, we, we knew, I, we'd certainly seen stuff where they'd been funny before, but had no idea how good their comic chops were. And people are funny or they aren't. That's true. But yeah, it's, but that, that's one of the, been the, one of the more joyful things for me in, in watching that show is getting to see them, you know, act these characters that, you know, for the last 40 years, I hadn't been able to see that side of them. And their, their comic timing is also amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it's great. Um, so I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask for some sort of update on the Friends reunion that everybody's super excited about. Is there any uh, anything you can share about that? We're shooting it. We're going to shoot it. <laughs> and it, it All right. Well, that's progress. Yeah. Um, it looks like we'll be shooting it in April. So fingers that's crossed. Soon. fingers crossed if everything is well and there's no more surge. But yeah, yeah, it's it's gonna happen. <laughs> All right. It's gonna happen one way or the other. <laughs> All right, well, that's good to know. Um, the last thing I wanna ask before um, we let you go is, is there a lesson or lessons you've learned over the course of your career that you, you wish you could go back and tell that person who's first starting out? There are two lessons. And, and these are for showrunners as much as anything. That the best way to lead is by collaborating. And as a showrunner, I feel like one of my jobs is I'm, I'm like the camp mom <laughs> where everybody in the production camp are my campers, they're my kids. And I have a responsibility to make sure that they are happy doing this job. I work really hard for a happy crew there's no yelling. Nobody gets to yell at anybody. People can pull them aside and say, we need to talk, but there's no yelling. There's no craziness. Those are things, you know, that some of them were hard lessons. I mean, not that I was ever a yeller. There are things I wish I'd known and didn't have to discover for myself. I mean, that, that's obviously great advice for showrunners, but I think that also probably extends to anybody in any sort of position where you're leading a team and especially in a creative field where stress is high, pressure is high. I'll tell you one more thing that I wish I'd learned. To work harder for equity in the writer's room and in the crew. Um, I didn't do enough of that. I, I did not in a conscious way go out and say, there is inequity right now for people of color, for people with disabilities. And I need to go the extra step to make sure that they are represented in both my crew and my writer's room more than they were. Well, I, th I mean, that's obviously the industry right now is going through a collective sort of reckoning with that sort of stuff. So it's great to hear that, you know, that's something that you feel like, you know, you've learned from um, and hopefully others feel the same. And, you know, as we move forward, uh, we start to see more of that. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you. Uh, Great questions. Oh, thank you. We're looking forward to the last season uh, of the show and for the Friends reunion. So Me everybody too. stay tuned for that. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, Marta. Thank you. Thanks again to Marta Kaufman for coming on the show. Grace and Frankie is available right now on Netflix. Friends is available on HBO Max. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Right on.